Welcome to the Gamative Performance Podcast, Episode 25. On this episode of the podcast, I get to talk with Coach Brian Phillips. Coach Phillips has been at many cool locations and is most currently the Director of Sports Performance at the University of Massachusetts. Coach Phillips and I talk about his approach to speed training, the importance of being on the same page as a staff, the importance of continuing education, as well as many other things. I think you're really going to get a lot out of this one. So without further ado, here is Coach Brian Phillips. Coach Phillips, thank you so much for your time today. Really looking forward to uh, chopping it up with you and catching up a little bit. For the listeners at home, will you tell us a little bit about your background, your motivation, and uh, where you currently are? Absolutely. I appreciate you having me on first off. Uh, I'm a Massachusetts native, born and raised here, uh, went to high school here and everything like that. From there, I was always an athlete, and then I ended up at Springfield College. So I started my undergrad at Springfield College, Mm -hmm. played football, went there to be a a gym teacher and then coach high school football. Mm. But that's actually when I was first exposed uh, to being, to having a college strength coach, and I kind of fell in love with it right there. Mm -hmm. At Springfield, I kind of bit that bug, and and from Springfield, that kind of led me to uh, a path in this this field. So I transferred to Bridgewater State, actually, and I started as as an intern at Northeastern University in Boston. Uh, from there, I had a you know tremendous experience working with Coach Cahill. Mm-hmm. Um, there was a bunch of good coaches on staff. And from Northeast, I led to uh, USC, Southern California, as a, another intern position. And that's really when I was exposed to really high-level college football, mm-hmm. and as you know. And their tremendous staff, from Aaron Osmus to Tim Karen and, and all the way down. Um, and, and that fortunately led me to a position at the University of Idaho as a graduate assistant. There was a connection from USC to Idaho. So I, you know, I didn't think twice. I really trusted that staff at USC to, to lead me in the right direction. So I ended up at Idaho for two years, which was a tremendous experience. Uh, working with Coach Arnold Morris and the staff out there, mm-hmm. which the next stop kept me on West and was at University of Nevada. And, and I was there for, for just about a year with, with Coach Ed and Coach Sammons and, and some other guys out there, which was just another completely different uh, kind of background, kind of different philosophy, and exposed me to things that I haven't really been exposed to yet. Mm-hmm. So a tremendous learning experience there, working with different teams as well. And then finally, you know, that led me to West Point uh, to work back with Coach Karen. And, and at all, you know, I got to spend three years there with a, a staff that, you know, was, was really top-notch in the league from, from, from the top to the bottom mm-hmm. and every aspect. You know, after three years at West Point, I had the ability to, to be the director at Elon University, something that I've always wanted to do in this profession. Uh, you know, I, I couldn't pass that opportunity up as hard as it was to leave West Point. Uh, to run my own program was, like I said, a goal of mine. So went to Elon University. Uh, only was there for a year, expected to be a little bit longer. But this opportunity here at UMass popped up, mm-hmm. once again, to be the director. And, you know, that's, that's where I'm currently at. Got here in January of 18, so going on about month 10 at UMass now. You know, here at UMass, I'm the director of sport performance. We have 21 Division I sports. 650 student athletes, uh, seven full-time staff members. So it's a bigger program here that you know I've run compared to, to being at Elon. Mm-hmm. Uh, being back, you know, here in Massachusetts, that Division One program is, is something that's always been a goal on. That's awesome. Will you expand a little bit on your time at Army and how that's affected your uh, current outlook? Sure. West Point is definitely a special place, you know, and I think what, what made it special is the people that you're around there more so than anything else. Mm-hmm. Starting with the staff, you know, Coach Karen, Will Greenberg, Darren Boston. Ryan has, like, we just had a staff that I think was unparalleled to many other staffs, you know, and mm-hmm. I think what we implemented, what the, what the kids saw from us every day, it, it helped that process be as good as it possibly could. And West Point is obviously special, you know, the, those kids go through on a daily basis, it's just different. It's different from a, a normal college athlete where they can just wake up and roll out of bed and go to class with whatever they fell asleep in and, mm-hmm. and have a good day, you know, from those kids there, they have to wake up and make sure that everything is, is done the right way, mm. uh, wear the right things, eat food at the same time, you know, just, just do things differently that I don't think are appreciated by everyone. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but they work so hard there, um, and, and, and they believe. And when, when you have those those things put together, you have a pretty special product when the end comes out. So, you know, being there three years, the first, the first two years, I don't think they reflected uh, the wins and losses as we, as we would have liked, but mm-hmm. there was a lot of wins in the locker room, a lot of wins uh, wins in the weight room, stuff that people couldn't, on the outside couldn't see, 
and finally put that to fruition year three and, and, and beat Navy and, and winning a bowl game, um, you know, is is probably the high of, of my coaching career and athletic mm-hmm. career being on the field like that. Yeah. Uh, and, and West Point is a, you know, it captured all your emotions at that place. There's there's highs, there's lows, there's struggles. Um, but I think it, when it's all said and done, those rewards are, are, are so valuable and mean so much, probably more than, than at a lot of other places. Mm, okay. No, that's really, really cool. So what do you think you learned from uh, being lead of analytics that has been a big benefit to you in your other positions? Yeah, I, I think there's a lot of things, you know. Um, probably one of the most important things to understand are workloads, mm. both high workloads, low workloads. And it's obviously become more popularized to a lot of Gavit's work and acute chronic workload and, and the way they categorize it that way. Um, but it really just gives you a, a quantitative number of, like, you know exactly what an athlete's output was for that day. Mm. And it way a lot of the guesswork or you know you practice was this long they had this many periods so we think that they did this you mm-hmm. know that it takes away that kind of guesswork and gives us some absolutes um and the workload piece it's not always that the workloads are too high yeah a lot of times it can be workloads are too low mm. you know so we need to make sure that we're we're adding enough additional work on the side to to get them up to speed so they can handle those workloads over time mm. and we know that you know injury prevention uh, having a high workload, a high chronic workload is going to be a tremendous benefit of keeping guys resilient and healthy. Mm-hmm. So that's something that, you know, we've kind of taken from the in-season model, the workloads of practice, and try to take that and put that into our off-season training to make sure that we're hitting the max velocities that we're doing practice, mm-hmm. to make sure we're hitting uh, the excels and decelerations, uh, to make sure this, that, you know, our workload per minutes are, are comparable to what they're, what they're going through during practice and then in games so we can actually – prepare them for the sport rather than just like you know put something on paper and make them look like we're preparing them for sport mm. so i say the workload piece yeah that's probably a big benefit of that uh i think probably a missing benefit too is that you know you actually get to know your athletes pretty well mm. and you get to ask them better questions because you see what they're going through okay uh, and something like a wellness questionnaire where you're getting something like stress sleep uh mood uh, well-being, academics, you just, you can kind of dig deeper and, and peel back some of the layers of, mm-hmm. of what's going on in the athlete's life. Okay. Instead of just being about weight-driven numbers mm. or being in the weight room, weight, room, weight, room, weight room, it's more what's going on outside of the weight room. Yeah. You know, why are you sleeping three hours a night? Mm. Why do you, how come you've been in a bad mood the past four days? Mm-hmm. It, it, it gets you to ask better questions to get to know them better. And I think at the end of the day, I mean, that's what it's about, develop relationships with your athletes. Yeah. So, I think all those pieces and then you know, probably getting better at Excel and wasting yeah. a lot of, I will not say wasting, but spending a lot of time yeah. on Excel and getting aggravated and frustrated. But I think that's certainly a piece of efficiency for a strike coach. Yeah. So what what would, are some things that you say what you would use to help compliance, right? So for example, on those wellness questionnaires um, or even anything where it's, where it's athlete driven, right? So how do you increase compliance on those kind of things? Really probably an old school approach and going pen and paper. Mm. I, I've, I've found out through both my time in Nevada, mm-hmm. West Point, Elon, that the best compliance you're going to get from questionnaires is doing pen and paper. Mm. And I've used Coach Me Plus. I've used an app that's on everyone's phone. At the end of the day, it always comes back to me putting the questionnaire in their locker mm. and me pick those, those up at the end of the day and manually type those into my computer. Okay. And there's a little bit more legwork, I think, on your end. Mm-hmm. But at the end of the day, if you're not getting compliance and that kind of stuff, then I think you have data that, that doesn't mean anything. Yeah. You know? So, um, it's probably a very uh, archaic approach, but the pen and paper approach has has been the best for getting compliance. And mm-hmm. then I think giving athlete feedback. You know, if, if you're collecting GPS and, and catapult metrics, post up who had the highest velocity for that day. Let them know mm-hmm. what their workloads were. Um, give them feedback of each practice or, or each session that you think is important. Mm-hmm. And it becomes really competitive. You know, all yeah. of you guys, we've kind of put some things in a group me, so that way everyone on the team can see it. Who had the highest velocity for that day? And guys want to know their top speeds every day. Mm-hmm. And you can see them kind of chasing the ball faster or finishing a play better, uh, doing things that directly correlate to some of those metrics that, you know, I, I think becomes a, a valuable piece in, in the whole puzzle. Mm. Okay. Um, and so uh, looking at kind of your earlier career, and you touched on it a little bit, right? So you've you've worked with, like, men's basketball in the past. Um, but what ultimately made you decide to go the football route? Um, and what kind of drove that decision? Yeah, I've always played football growing up, you know, both high school and played at Springfield for a little bit. So football has always been something that, I, that I've loved, enjoyed, and, and has been important to me. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I, th- I really truly think that, you know, being exposed to the guys at USC, like I said, 
uh, Aaron Osmus, Tim Karen, mm-hmm. and those guys. And then, you know, for, moving forward, those w- that way, those coaches probably have the biggest impact on me. Mm-hmm. And I think you naturally, as a human being, you, you tend to, to go back to what's impacted you in a positive way. Yeah. I want to say it's, it's because of my experiences. Mm-hmm. And not that I haven't enjoyed training other teams. Like men's basketball has been fun. Mm-hmm. I spent a lot of time training track and field, which I think is, is tremendous. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I'll train any sport. Yeah. But, you know, I think football has a little bit more deep down uh, passion for me. And, and I'll just, fortunately, I've never go that route. Mm. Okay. So how important is continuing education to you? It's extremely important. I, I don't think if you're... If you're not spending time every day mm-hmm. on continuing education, I, I don't know why. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I think there's so much available information, whether it costs money or whether it's free. Like there's access for everyone. Mm-hmm. And the amount of research that comes out on a daily basis, I mean, you can just roll through Twitter and, and find 10 research papers mm-hmm. within five minutes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the stuff's out there now um, through books, through calling coaches. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's just such an... Uh, an access information like I, I don't know why you wouldn't be taking time to utilize that every day and mm-hmm. I try to book in my days with the beginning of my day um, it starts off in education I yeah. get here a little bit earlier so I don't have to really start my quote-unquote work until after mm-hmm. um, you know I, I either read or, or listen to, to somebody or something yeah, yeah. Um, and I think another good way to utilize continuing education is through your, your commutes you know mm-hmm. every day I have a 30 minute commute each way that's an hour I have guaranteed of getting a podcast or, or an audio, audio book in. Mm-hmm. And, and over time, that stuff adds up. So I think the access to it and the, the importance of it is, is essential to be a really good strength coach. Yeah, no, I, I 100% agree. Um, on a different note, right, how important is it, do you think, to have uh, like hobbies or life outside of strength and conditioning? I'm getting better at that. Okay. I, I, think it's, I think it's certainly important. Yeah. Um, since I've been here at UMass, I guess really since last year at North Carol in North Carolina, mm-hmm. I've, I've picked up golf. You okay. know, and, and golf's been something that I think we live in such a sympathetic go go go, mm. kind yeah, of instant feedback life as as a strength coach mm-hmm. that it's really good to kind of turn that switch off sometimes and go out there and play golf is a sport that if you go fast, you just become more frustrated. You know, yeah. if you to slow down that that group in front of you is forcing you to go slow. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think, you know, golf's been something that I've picked up that I really enjoy. Um, but I, I think it's essential. You, you should have something outside of strength conditioning. Yeah. I think an, a, a personal life outside of here um, is only going to improve your professional life inside of here. So yeah. it's something sometimes you have to work at a little bit harder. Mm-hmm. Um, you can get caught up in here a lot. But yeah. It, it's, it, it's, it's important to, to have good work-life balance, I believe. Yeah. No, and that's and that's really interesting too, right? Because a lot of us, um, some of our outlets is is training, right? But it's sometimes you it's so hard for you to train, and it's just right outside your office. So, it's it's a crazy balance, right? Yeah, it, it certainly is. It's a struggle, but it's a struggle worth fighting. Yeah, most definitely. So, what is your philosophy for how you manage your staff? Yeah, it's a good question. You know, and I, I think it certainly depends. Now that I've had the opportunity to manage two different staffs, mm-hmm. uh, where you're at, you know, and, and one thing I probably didn't. Um, consider it strongly enough is when I took over a position of, of me coaching my staff. Mm-hmm. You know, I was more focused on creating a culture, creating my uh, coaching my, my players mm-hmm. rather than coaching my staff. Mm-hmm. And when you can't necessarily hire your staff or your people, mm-hmm. or people that know your system, if you don't coach your staff up, they're the ones who are relaying the messages to your players. Mm-hmm. You're just going to get a ton of confusion. Yeah, and you know right away you have to get everyone on the same board from terminology perspective using the same language mm-hmm. you know an anti-rotation press can't be an anti-rotation press a pal off press a bam push away you have to name that one thing mm-hmm. and terminology is something huge for our staff when it comes to uh coaching our athletes uh, but i think even before that is the relationship piece and you know with our staff i want them to be transparent i want to be transparent with them and I want them to know, and, and I tell them this, that everyone has a vote. Mm-hmm. If there's something that's on your mind, something that needs to be said, then, then let it be said. Mm-hmm. You know, we meet every every week for a staff meeting where we go over um, some updates for the week. We go over something educational. Mm-hmm. Um, and it just gets all of us in a room. Yeah. We're, here at UMass, we have four different weight rooms. Mm-hmm. And like I said, seven full-time coaches. So that adds an immediate kind of disconnect, mm-hmm. you know, with with each coach in their own arena, not necessarily going to see them coach or even get to see them if we didn't have a meeting. Mm-hmm. So getting everyone in, in one room, letting everyone's voice be heard, um, I, I think are extremely valuable in, in terms of your staff and, and letting them know that what they say matters. Yeah. You know, and 
not necessarily means we're going to make change, but mm-hmm. they're being heard, and over time we'll, we'll we'll take those suggestions and we'll take those ideas and mm-hmm. and hopefully come up with the best plan of attack. But you know, if you're not educating your staff and if you're not getting them on board, I think it, it can create a lot of disconnect down the road. Um, and they're a reflection of me as well. Mm-hmm. You know, sports performance department falls under the umbrella of what I run. So if someone in one weight room is doing something that you know we don't deem as acceptable for our staff, mm-hmm. then that's a, a negative reflection of, of what's going on from my end. Mm-hmm. So it's important to, to meet as a staff. I truly believe that uh, it takes a little more work on your end, but it's work that's definitely uh, worth it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and just you know, having a staff where it's more than just a a work staff, you know, you guys enjoy being around each other and, mm-hmm. and, and things like that are important. Yeah, no, that's that's really interesting. Okay, so in contrast, how what is your philosophy for how you manage your athletes? Yeah, so I, I think still relationships are extremely important, mm-hmm. you know, and that's that's kind of my belief when it comes to to, to training our athletes. And we're gonna, you know, we're gonna we're gonna train them the best we can, but it, it starts with us develop relationships mm-hmm. and getting to know them on, on levels that you know we can get the most out of them. Yeah, you can, you can have the best program in the world, you can have the most technology, you can do whatever you want, but if they don't believe in you as as a coach, it doesn't really matter what you implement. Mm-hmm. So you know, we we try to be there for them. We try to um, you know before they even come to the room, we'll. We're gonna say everyone's name. You know, yeah. That we acknowledge them right away. That way we can connect to them hopefully immediately. Mm-hmm. Um, but but our from a philosophy for training, um, you know I think it's all encompassing. We what probably makes us a little bit more different is we spend more time outside on the field, mm-hmm. developing things like speed, movement, agility, uh, ability, energy system development, uh, just some stuff outside of the weight room that mm-hmm. is probably non traditional a little bit. Mm-hmm. Uh, not that the weight room isn't important. It certainly is. You know we're gonna lift hard. We're gonna lift. lift. We're gonna we're gonna squat. We're gonna press. We're gonna pull. We're gonna do all the major movement patterns. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I think we complement that really well in the field of our speed work and, and things that uh, make us more efficient as a, as an athlete. Mm-hmm. And we're performance driven, right? We're yeah. not numbers. Uh, my ego is not weight on the bar. Mm-hmm. Uh, I really that doesn't help me sleep better at night. You know, <laughs> I want I want to see our guys move really well. I want to see our guys perform really well when they put the pads on and and they feel like our training has helped them improve for their for their position. Yeah. Know, rather than just getting them stronger, getting them bigger, which are hopefully five to products of our program. Mm, okay. And that's a perfect segue, right? So one of your many skills as a strength coach is speed development. So will you expand a little bit on your speed and agility development program? Yeah, sure. So it certainly depends on the time of the year. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, you know, for example, I'll use our off-season program, obviously, where our speed is more important because we're, we're in our in-season you know, we allow the sport to take you know care of those demands. Mm-hmm. Um, but in the winter time and in the summertime, um, you know, we we train speed really four days a week. Mm-hmm. And I've traditionally followed a high low approach, you know, that Charlie Francis popularized. But as of recently, we've kind of gone to more frequency of our of our speed training, mm-hmm. and I think we've accomplished that successfully by kind of limiting the volume. So we're not crushing them on volume on two days a week and kind of back off two days a week mm-hmm. we're just you know kind of microdosing that throughout the week um we're training linear speed once or twice depending on the time of the year we're training multi-directional speed once or twice depending on the time of the year mm-hmm. and then we'll condition once or twice depending on the time of the year so um every day there's going to be some kind of high cns output mm-hmm. and it's you know a reduction of volume is how we get that in um throughout the week but you know we, we break up our, our speed training into linear speed multi-directional speed and then within our linear speed program, there's both an acceleration and a max velocity day. Mm-hmm. So early on in our phase, it's usually more acceleration based. Um, we do a lot of resistance stuff. Um, short sprints, zero to 15 yards, is really you know our major acceleration zone. Um, and, and we try to pair the stuff up we do on the field with the stuff we do in the weight room. Mm. So if we're doing any kind of like eccentric block in the weight room. It's probably a time where we do a lot of our acceleration work on the field. Mm-hmm. Um, and the same with our max strength work. If we're doing some max strength work, it's probably when we're doing our acceleration work. Mm-hmm. We know that the ground contact times are higher. We're going to spend more time on the ground. The joint position angles are, are going to be more similar. So we try to make those as compatible as we can. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we transition more to our max velocity work, which will be later in the phase, uh, later in the summer, depending on the time of the year. That's when we get more to our, our reactive type work, mm. uh, more of our velocity-based work in the weight room. And, you know, our, our max velocity for us is really categorized by 20, 20 yards or farther in our sprint work. Mm. Um, you know, we do things like flying tens for that, uh, some in and out kind of runs. Mm-hmm. We make things competitive a lot to, to increase velocity, increase output. Um, 
So it's really just just slight adjustments in, in our in our yardage in our weight room stuff and, and making those compatible as we can. And then you know that will carry over to our multi-directional days where a lot of those drills start off really as, as close drills. Mm -hmm. We're doing a lot of coaching early on. Um, teach them how to get into good athletic positions, teach them how to feel different parts of their foot, you know, different parts of their base support and center of mass. And then once we feel like we've accomplished those well, we'll make things resistant and then we'll make things more reactive uh, as, as they're reacting, you know, using some of those perceptual skills, mm -hmm. uh, um, you know, that we, you know, hopefully develop later on in the stages. So, you know, overall, there's a lot that goes into it, but I don't think it's, it's as difficult as people, you know, kind of put it out to be, mm -hmm. you know, there's, there's nothing better than just sprinting fast yeah, and yeah. get that in the line, mm. making them compete, calling up the winner. If you want high outputs and high speeds, that's it's probably the most simple drill, but the most effective drill you can get. And and the, the modalities are up to your toolbox. You know mm. what do you have available? Yeah. Do you have a hill? Use a hill to sprint. Do you have sleds? Use sleds to sprint. Do you have bands? Do you have chains? Use those to sprint. You know, like mm -hmm. you have cones. Everyone has something. It doesn't matter what level you're at, from high school to Division One. Uh, everyone has the ability to, to change the modality. It's really up to you to how you implement it. Yeah, no, I think that's really important because a lot of people, they see certain people doing um, using a lot of equipment, right? And they say, oh, we don't have a lot of equipment. We can't train. We can't do what we need to do, right? And I, I think that uh, that idea that you just kind of mentioned is, is so important that you can do, it's not that difficult. You can do whatever, you know, at your level. You just have to scale it to where you're at. Um, so follow up with that. Would you say that your program differs from different programs? And if so, what would be the biggest difference? Yeah, I think it does in terms of us. You know, we, we want to be really strong, but mm -hmm. I don't think we're we're a team that's going to have like a board on our wall with like this is our best squat guy, this is our mm -hmm. best bench guy, this is our best deadlift guy. You know, we we don't really do a lot of time testing, mm -hmm. and we build our testing into our training, mm -hmm. which allows us to train more frequently throughout the year. Yeah, and I think we get better when we when we train than when we test mm -hmm. personally. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think that's probably something that's different. Um, you know, I, I think our coaching style is a little bit different too. I think we try to cue. I think we try to coach as precise and and accurate as possible. I don't think we're just yelling out words or, or saying things just to be heard. You know, the, the words we use are so valuable that we want to make changes with every word we use. Mm. So you know, I, I think as a staff, it, it's it's you know, energy is brought, but we're not just wasting wasting tongue. You yeah, know, it, it got to be accurate. It's got to be on point. Um, and, and especially with the staff, like we have, sometimes we only have two staff members, mm -hmm. and then other times we have four staff members. So if, if we're not clear and directive with with what we're saying, or more importantly, what we want from our athletes, then mm -hmm. then we're not going to get that. Yeah, you know. And, and I think um, that that's probably something that we we make important is our cueing, is our feedback, and making sure that you know that we can give them some some actionable direct feedback to make change. Mm -hmm. I like that. Okay. So what are some resources that have had a big impact on you, whether it's a book, a podcast, um, like a seminar, or just a, a talk with another coach? Sure. Uh, I think I first started uh, probably 10 years ago at strengthcoach.com, which mm. is something I'm still a member at. Mm -hmm. um, keeping that membership going, I think there's just invaluable information on there. Uh, I think Coach Boyle and all the contributors that are on that site um, offer a, a perspective that's valuable and, and is worth listening to. Um the Altus program. Mm. I went out there for a mentorship a couple of years ago to Phoenix, and that was the best um, hands-on seminar, conference, whatever you want to call it, that I've been a part of. Mm. And there, there's nothing hidden there from the track, from their therapy, from their weight room. Um, yeah, everything's right in front of you. Mm -hmm. and some of the best coaches in the world, Stu McMillan, Dan Path, like those guys have, uh, have accomplished something special. Mm. Yeah, um, so those, those say are probably the, the big two that, that have stuck out to me. And then, you know, it, it, it's up to you really to keep things going. There's yeah. so many good podcasts out there. You yeah. can just search the most basic word and find something that's <laughs> going to be yeah. helpful to you. Now, like even things, I think a, a point, too, is it doesn't have necessarily have to be uh, strength and conditioning related. Yeah. You know, do, like, download the TED Talks. Like, there's mm -hmm. a ton of good TED Talks. Mm -hmm. read, read, some, read some business books if, if you want to, you know, learn to, to, to run your organization better. Mm. Um, I really enjoy reading a lot of coaches' biographies. That's something that I've been doing lately. So it really just depends, um, you know, what interests you. But I don't think you should just have a unilateral lens of focus and being like, it has to be strength, it has to be conditioning, it has mm. to do with what's in the weight room. I think you can learn a ton of information from stuff that comes from outside of the weight room uh, that you can come back and, and bring to your program. Mm. I know I 100% I agree with that as well because that just makes you very one-dimensional and, and harder to relate to in certain aspects, right? Like. 
Like athletes don't care necessarily about strength and conditioning per se, right? But they care about a lot of other things. So the more that you could take in as a person and, and the growth you have really is going to help you connect in the long run. So I really like that. Yeah, for sure. And then uh, kind of moving into this last segment here, right? With just a few rapid fire questions, right? So um, if you have any, what are some quotes that you live by? I think a good one is uh, if you don't stand for something, you'll mm. fall for anything. Mm. You know, and I think that really goes back to all our day one stuff is having a why. Yeah. You know, and it, for both me as a coach, like why do I want to roll out of bed every morning? Mm-hmm. Why am I excited to do that? Yeah. Um, to our athletes, like why are you here? Yeah. You know, there has to be greater why than than you just get a scholarship check every day because that <laughs> that's going to fizzle out after four years. Yeah. You know, so have a purpose, have an identity, know your why, and I think it's it's. It makes those difficult times, it makes those times of change, those times if you don't want to do something, a lot easier when you know your purpose and why you're doing it. Mm, okay, I like that. And then you kind of mentioned an answer to this earlier, right? But is there a specific thought or experience that you've held on to from the past that has made a big difference in your life now? It's a good question. Uh, I, don't know, I don't know if there's one singular experience. You know, I, I think... Just being immersed with the the coaches I've been around and seeing them how they work, mm-hmm. uh, expectations and 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 don't be too big to do the small things. Yeah. You know, like I think that's a, an important piece. And all the coaches I've been around have, have really been about the people, the relationships, the kids, and and, and we have a job because we're athletes. You know, mm-hmm. at the end of the day, like it's about them. So, I, you know, I don't think there's a singular response to that, but just a collection of, of all the experiences put together. Mm, okay, um, what is the best advice you've ever been given? Best advice, the best advice I've ever been given. I don't know if there's a one thing that immediately pops in my head for that. Mm-hmm. To be honest with you. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. What is the uh, worst advice you've ever been given? <laughs> the worst advice. See, see negative and, and bad yeah. things. I try to erase from my mind right away. Yeah. Those, those things that uh, I try not to hold on to. Yeah. Um, so, I don't know those advice pieces. I don't think I have um, any one thing that is yeah. positive or bad that I've really held on to. to okay, fair enough. Um, what has one one of the uh, biggest struggles in your life been? And how have you overcome um, it? Yeah, I, I think possibly, you know, being a young strength coach, mm-hmm. you know, I, I think I've been fortunate to be in, in, in some positions at a, at a younger age, mm-hmm. uh, which I think, right or wrong, doesn't matter, but people will give uh, a certain image, a certain thought to, a, to an age, mm-hmm. to a number, yeah. which, to each your own, that's fine. Um, but that's something that obviously you can't change as, as myself or as yeah. a person. Yeah. Um, and you can't let that distract you. You can't let that be um, an issue. You can't let that kind of slow you up in any way. Mm-hmm. You know, Being strong in your belief and, and confident in your ability I think is important. So I, I think that's probably something that you deal with as a young strength coach. Mm-hmm. Um, but control your control. Yeah, no, I like it. Um, so what currents or what projects are you currently working on? And how can people kind of reach out to you and follow your journey? You know, I think for here as a college strength coach, every day is a project, right? Mm-hmm. Like, we never yeah. know what we're going to get, you know, and every day we're trying to create this masterpiece of, of what a perfect program is, mm-hmm. what a perfect training session is. Uh, every day we're, we're trying to figure that out. So I don't think, I don't think there's any kind of book or anything mm-hmm. project like that wise that, that I'm, I'm working on, but just trying to be a really good strength coach, mm-hmm. you know, trying to be a really good director and, yeah. and, and lead our staff in hopefully a positive way. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we're all benefiting from that. Um, so, you know, at the end of the day, it's every day is a project for us. And we're yeah. trying to create the best masterpiece we can. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Okay. So how can people kind of reach out to you, ask you questions, follow your journey, anything like that? Yeah, you can, uh, my work email, mm-hmm. which is brianp at umass.edu. You no, know, you can always send me an email. I'll, uh, I'll get back as soon as I can on that. You know, important for me to, to try to answer all that stuff and get back the best I can because mm-hmm. I was that person, and I still am that person, reaching out to, to, to coaches, to mm-hmm. to resources, to do, to doing all that stuff continuously. Yeah. Um, so I think that's probably one of the best things about our profession, our community, mm-hmm. is that most people are pretty open. Yeah. You know, it's it's up to you to reach out to them. Mm-hmm. And nine times out of ten, like I've had a positive um, occurrence by doing that. Yeah. So you know, through email is probably the best way. I'm on Twitter. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm on Instagram. You can get me on there. Um, and then you know I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Awesome. Well, Coach Phillips, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. I think there's a lot of good takeaways, um, and I look forward to connecting with you again in the future. Thanks, Juan. I appreciate it, man. All right. Talk to you soon. Thanks again for joining me. And if you enjoyed the podcast, please go ahead and give it a five-star review on iTunes and go ahead and write a review.
a few more people have started to catch that wave and it's really helped others connect to the podcast and, and be able to share and learn. And so that's really the goal of this whole thing is, is to be able to connect other people to professionals that can help them out, whether it be as a mentor or just teaching them something new. Next week, we'll have another exciting guest. So until then, this is the Game of Performance Podcast.